I know it's gonna be evening where some of you are perhaps, pretty early in the morning where some of you are, lunchtime. I've got a four-legged friend begging for the scraps of my lunch here next to me. I'm Shannon Jarrett. I know we've got more people who are going to join us this morning, this afternoon, and I'm going to go ahead and get started so we can give as much time as possible to uh, three of the authors of papers in our special issue. I am joined today by the special issue co-editor, who I've become uh, much closer as colleagues and friends with, Julie Bobbitt. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of the editorial staff, Suzanne Meeks and Karen Jung for their work in seeing this special issue to uh, fruition. I'll share a little bit of a story and turn things over to Julie, who will do introductions after I cover housekeeping. And uh, Julie and I started talking about this special issue a couple of different years ago. Julie had a long history of implementation science research, and I was starting to learn how important it was. And we were at a gerontologist editorial board meeting. This was in the Austin, Texas uh, annual scientific meeting. So that was 2019. And so it takes a little while, but uh, we identified this interest. Other groups were brainstorming ideas for special issues. And we uh, apparently made a pretty good pitch. We were lucky to have colleagues, including one of our speakers today, who were able to help us think about the importance of having an implementation science focus within the gerontologist. Uh, we had joined a special interest group that one of our colleagues, Beth Prusacek, I'm sure I didn't pronounce that correctly, had um, formed with the implementation uh, science, dif uh, dissemination and implementation science group. And uh, we wanted to bring that to GSA. The reason being that there's so much work that we as gerontologists do studying interventions to improve uh, individual family and community health with a lot of emphasis on that individual outcome. Implementation science has been around for a long time. Uh, like gerontology, it draws on multiple disciplines draws on multiple theories and frameworks. It uh, doesn't always address things that we, well, sorry, we in gerontology don't always address some of the things that implementation science uh, is uniquely positioned to do. And that includes things like paying attention to the context, what it is that's going to determine in what context, in, with what kinds of practices, in what kinds of circumstances are evidence-based interventions going to be adopted, effective, sustained, and uh, potentially scalable and uh, a, a tailorable for different situations and contexts. And so we wanted to highlight the work that is being done by our colleagues with implementation science in their gerontology research. And you'll find within that special issue, we had a good response to this call for papers. We've got 18 papers. We couldn't present all of them here today. We're lucky to have our, our three guest speakers. And you'll find examples of taking implementation science models and work from uh, intervention testing to uh, develop, sorry, intervention development to intervention testing, bringing it to scale, adapting it, scaling it up for large scale delivery, and sometimes even de-implementing if an intervention is proving to be ineffective. So we're uh, lucky to have those uh, three authors with us today. With that, I'm gonna remind you of some of our housekeeping points. Uh, we would uh, love, if you haven't already started, to get your name and affiliation in the chat so we know who's here. We'll remind you that uh, things are being recorded. Uh, if your colleagues couldn't make it to this event or you want to share it with somebody afterwards, this uh, recorded webinar will be available on YouTube. And we're going to remind people, it's pretty quiet what I can hear so far. So I trust all of you have got your uh, video off if you aren't a speaker or, or a facilitator and your audio muted. We are gonna be keeping track of questions in the chat box and we are gonna have our presenters speak first and save time for uh, questions and discussion at the end of the hour. And please let your colleagues know about uh, this session and about upcoming webinars as well. 
And with that, I'm going to turn that over to my co-editor and colleague, Julie Bobbitt. Thanks. Thank you, Shannon. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, the special issue of the Gerontologist, as Shannon mentioned, contains papers with topics ranging from pre and early implementation um, to adaptation of evidence-based programs, scaling up implementation, and even de-implementation. And our speakers uh, for today represent that range of our special issue. So I'm going to introduce all three. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Natasha Gallant, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Regina, and she is going to be presenting um, pre-implementation study on integrating technology adoption models into implementation science methodologies. Our second speaker, speaker sorry, is Dr. Lauren Parker from the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health who will present her work on the cultural adaptation of dementia care for Hispanic Latino caregivers. And then finally, Dr. Jamie Hughes, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Implementation Science, section on gerontology and geriatric medicine at Wake Forest School of Medicine, who will talk about enhanced implementation approaches to support national adoption and scale up. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Gallant to get us started. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really, I was really excited to see this call for special papers because my work does kind of go into both of those sides, gerontology and implantation science. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that I did during my dissertation uh, on uh, integrating both technology adoption models and implantation science methodologies. And it is a pre-implementation study. So talking about that process from start to finish, we were really looking at what do we need to know now to make changes to what we're trying to implement so that the implementation is successful. And so um, this article was published uh, along with some of my co-authors, uh, Dr. Thomas Hydrosteropoulos and trainees Rhonda Stoppin and Emma Fury. So first off, just talking about the um, Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. This is a framework that is very often used. I will acknowledge there is now a CIFR 2.0, but this work was done when CIFR 2.0 was not around. So um, this is one of the main frameworks that was used in this work, really looking at the uh, individuals involved in the implementation, the inner, the outer setting, that process of implementation, and then the actual intervention, how, um, how it is before and after um, implementation. Um, and this model has been used lots for implementation studies, post-implementation studies. Very few uh, have used it for pre-implementation studies. And so that's why I wanted to do this work to show the benefits of pre-implementation to be able to leverage um, facilitators and address barriers ahead of time. Now, the other model that I introduced here was because what I was implementing and a lot of the work that I've done is around technology adoption. And so I wanted to find another comprehensive model um, that focused more on that technology piece, since the CIFR doesn't always um, fit just right for technology. Um, and so here, this is the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology. And basically, the biggest thing here is that there are these four constructs on the left-hand side, performance expectancy, which is basically how useful a technology uh, is perceived to be. Effort expectancy is how easy it seems to be to you, easy it seems to be to use. And social influence is how much other important uh, influential people think that you should use this technology. And facilitating conditions is really that organizational infrastructure that could support that technology. And the theory suggests that performance expectancy, effort expectancy, and social influence affect behavioral intentions. So this is really just how likely are you to use the technology? How much do you uh, want to use that technology? And then through that, it affects how much we actually use the technology once it's implemented. And facilitating conditions directly affects uh, actual use of technology. So really what I wanted to do is integrate the two. And more specifically, I did this, uh, or we did this by testing um, both of these models in the context of implementing an automated pain behavior monitoring system in long-term care settings. So this is currently um, a system that's still being tested in the lab, um, but it uses cameras and it processes images, or to process images of pain behaviors among long-term care residents. Uh, and hopefully uh, it will lead to, uh, 
automatically identifying which residents might need um, to be assessed for pain using a computer vision algorithm. So this is a complex technology, but what we wanted to do was at this point, because it's still being tested, see what are some factors that we need to consider when we are looking to do the implementation. So um, mediation models were used here. And what uh, we did was looking at those original uh, unified theory of uh, acceptance and use of technology predictors. So that would be performance expectancy, um, effort expectancy, uh, social influence and uh, facilitative conditions. But we want to see if some of these other factors uh, would predict these original predictors here and then uh, influence behavioral intentions. So just um, looking here, we wanted to basically add the CFER and some other variables we looked at before we entered it into this model here for the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology. So we tested this model by administering a comprehensive set of questionnaires, self-report measures to 164 nurses currently working in long-term care who are fluent in English. Um, and then these predictors that we included in, in the form of surveys was the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CEPR. But we also included a few others that were more focused on other aspects we thought might have an influence here. So readiness for organizational change, personality factors, locus of control, whether you think you know internally you're in control of things or there's external factors at play, and technology readiness, which is more of a, a trait um, different traits about how likely you are to adopt technology, like optimism about technology or insecurity around technology. So I went through the predictors and the um, outcomes was behavioral intentions. And now I'm gonna go over the significant results that we found from the mediation analyses. So what was revealed here was that in terms of the CFER, um, the outer setting, the inner setting and the process of implementation were found to be uh, fully mediated by performance expectancy and effort expectancy. So um, performance expectancy being how useful something is and effort expectancy, how easy to use it is. Um, so we found that these three here were fully mediated and intervention characteristics was only partially mediated. And so what this, suggests, and I'll talk about this later, is that when we are measuring pre to post implementation uh, with regards to maybe patient-oriented technologies like the pain uh, behavior monitoring system, um, we might not need to measure outer setting, inner setting, process of implementation as much because it is fully mediated, so we could only measure performance and effort expectancy instead. But intervention characteristics, there's still some aspects that are not being captured by performance and effort expectancy. We also found that um, readiness for organizational change had an effect as well. Um, and so this was around um, management support, which was fully mediated. Change efficacy was fully mediated by performance expectancy, none of the other variables, and appropriateness was partially mediated. And last but not least, we have um, optimism and insecurity with regards to technology readiness, optimism being fully mediated by performance and effort expectancy and insecurity being partially mediated. So um, you'll notice that social influence and facilitative conditions did not um, play any roles in the mediation models. It, there was no significance. And some of those other constructs we had either, there was no significance um, with the five factor model and locus of control. So what we ended up um, being able to develop, and um, it's a little small here on the screen, but really it, it was this model of integrating the CFER and the UTOT, the um, Unified Theory of Acceptance and Use of Technology. So performance expectancy and effort expectancy are the only ones here that are um, mediators uh, out of the original Unified Theory of Acceptance and Use of Technology. And then the ones that were fully mediated are in these, um, these boxes here that have the dotted lines. So we've got management support, outer setting, inner setting, process of implementation, optimism, and change efficacy. Uh, and I'll go through some recommendations, but um, really this is suggesting that maybe we don't need to measure all of these factors if we are measuring performance and effort expectancy. Um, but the ones that were partially mediated was intervention characteristics and 
again, intervention characteristics along with appropriateness, meaning that those factors or constructs should potentially be um, measured moving forward so that we can, um, um, so that we, we have a full idea of the implementation success um, or being able to try and predict that. So basically to sum that up, um, at regular intervals throughout that implementation process, it might be important for us to evaluate beliefs held by individuals about proposed technology. So per performance expectancy or how useful a technology is, effort expectancy or how easy to use a technology is, intervention characteristics and appropriateness. Um, so that's the first recommendation. And then in terms of pre-implementation studies, the really great thing about them is you can use those results, those findings to develop maybe an intervention of some kind that communicates those aspects of the technology to maybe increase its um, uh, successful implementation. So can we uh, maybe increase beliefs around the usefulness, the ease of use of the technology or provide training so that it's easier to use um, and basically yeah, demonstrate how it'll be useful, easy to use, appropriate for the setting and intervention characteristics. In terms of future direction, some of the limitations here is that it was only tested with this one um, uh, technology, the automated pain behavior monitoring system. And so it would be really great to replicate this with other uh, patient oriented technologies in healthcare settings and to attach that to the, um, the actual behaviors, the actual use of the technology. Because right now we're just looking at predicting behavioral intentions or someone's um, likelihood to adopt a technology. And we wanna see, does it actually affect uh, the use in the end? And we are testing that when we implement this new technology. Um, this was also not longitudinal. So that longitudinal mediation analysis might allow us to look at more of those causal pathways um, since this was cross-sectional and testing the generalizability of findings to other jurisdictions and stakeholder groups. So we worked with nurses here and we were in Saskatchewan, Canada. So um, other jurisdictions would be good to test uh, as well. So that's all I have for you today. Um, and here's some of my contact information and Twitter. Um, and thank you so much for letting me present today. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And um, next up is Dr. Lauren Parker. Thank you so much to Shannon and Julie for putting this special issue together. And I'm so excited to present and share some of my work. Um, just let me get my screen together. Okay. So um, again, I'm Lauren Parker, and I'm excited to present my work on um, It's More Than Language. Sorry about that. I'm having some technical difficulties. Here we go. OK, I'm presenting my work on It's More Than Language, Cultural Adaptation of a Proven Dementia Care Intervention. So I would like to, like to acknowledge my funding from um, NIA, who has funded a large part of this work. So I want to provide a bit of background to situate the importance of why we've culturally tailored an intervention for Hispanic and Latino populations. So many of you may know or may not know the Hispanic and Latino older adults are nearly one point times more likely to have dementia um, than any other group in the United States. Um, when we think about the Hispanic and um, Latino community, we know that a lot of um, a lot of these older adults are more likely to live within the community instead of using more formalized services for their care. We know that um, because of this great demand for community care, a lot of these um, older adults who are living with dementia will have a greater reliance on caregivers to support their care needs throughout the throughout the um, dementia continuum. There will be a high demand or responsibilities on these caregivers. While we know that dementia, taking care of providing care for someone who has dementia is a very large and arduous process in itself, Hispanic and Latino caregivers express more distress and more depressions than their white or black counterparts. And these caregivers are consistently underserved and underrepresented in supportive care trials. So it's a huge um, need in this community to really identify supports that can assist these caregivers. 
In terms of um, some more background, we know that when we look at the Hispanic and Latino population, particularly those who are living with dementia, they have a strong reliance on family to provide care. And so it's a, a huge family obligation or responsibility to provide care at home. Um, it's not seen as something as extra. It's seen as something that I have to do it because I care for a mother. They cared for me, for example, so I have to care for them. And so again, a lot of resources are often underutilized because of the lack of culturally and um, linguistic uh, appropriate services available to them. So oftentimes when we talk to these um, caregivers and people living with dementia, they might say that sometimes their values or their cultural norms are not represented in a lot of formalized services, therefore they might underutilize. But one service that is being utilized um, a one home community based service that is being utilized largely by Hispanic and Latino older adults is adult day services. And so adult day services is a great home and community based resource because it provides respite to caregivers and it also provides supports and activities for people living with dementia. So these services are used um, throughout the day it could be eight hours or it could be four hours Monday through Friday usually and it provides just a time, um, a time away for the person with dementia just to go and get an additional resources in the community. Community. And then if the, if the day is over, they can return back to their home. And so it, it responds to the values of wanting to stay home in the community, but also relieves the caregivers of some of the burden associated with providing care. So ADS Plus is a great um, resource and a case study to, um, to look at this um, this phenomenon of providing care for the community and also thinking about how we can adjust our services to reach the needs of Hispanic and Latino populations. So briefly, ADS Plus overall is a nationally pragmatic trial. And what we do in ADS Plus is that we augment um, services for ADS. So we, we, we already know that some caregivers are using adult day services, but we provide just a little, a little bit more support and assistance to improve caregiver well-being. And then hopefully our goal is that we increase the usage of adult day services. So ADS Plus is delivered by a staff member who is trained in the program. And before COVID, it was face-to-face -face meetings, but we know COVID has came and visited us for a long time. So we've become a little bit more flexible in providing ADS Plus the program by allowing um, those individuals to use a telehealth services to deliver and to um, have access to the ADS Plus program. The staff provide a variety of services um, related to disease education, referrals and linkage to different care, support, and other type of strategies that's really tailored to what the caregiver says their needs are and their challenges are and what they need assistance with in working with um, the person that they're caring for. So while we were rolling out the ADS Plus program, we realized that the sites that had a high proportion of Hispanic and Latino caregivers had a number of different challenges just with implementing the program. So some of the challenges that we observed were um, we observed that there was a huge pool, of, a waiting room of people who wanted to join the study, but one of our barriers, to, or excuse me, not a barrier, but one of our inclusion criteria is that individuals had to um, speak English. And so for our Hispanic and um, Latino sites, we realized that a lot of people wanted to join the study, but they might not have been comfortable with receiving an intervention in English, but that was, a, that was an inclusion criteria. So we excluded a number of um, folks just because of that um, inclusion criteria. And we also realized that there were a number of challenges with the um, interventionists with delivering the program because we had a number of technology, um, technology things, uh, activities and, um, systems, excuse me, that the um, interventionists had to go in to update information. And they had some challenges with updating and utilizing that technology. It's called REDCap. So the goal of our modifications were really to improve the cultural fit for both the staff and also for the families um, who were utilizing adult day so that we can increase engagement with our program. So the objectives of our my talk today is to report on the cultural adaptation of the ADS Plus program. I will go over to that in more detail in um, upcoming slides. And then also I will highlight how we use the framework for reporting adaptations and modification enhanced called the frame to discuss when modifications were made, who determined the modifications, what aspects of the inter interventions were modified, the relationship to fidelity and the reasons for the modification. But we already know that the, the reason for our modifications is that we wanted to improve the cultural fit. 
So the culture adaptation process model guided our culture adaptation. And there are three phases to this model. The first stage is that the researchers and the stakeholder collaborate to find a balance between the community needs and the scientific integrity. So we worked very, very closely with our interventionists from the um, sites that had a high proportion of Hispanic and Latino caregivers to really figure out like, what are your needs? So as scientists or researchers, myself and the other members of the team could have went in and said, this is what we identify your needs are, and this is where you need improvement. But maybe our needs might not have matched up with what the community needed. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we brought the community to um, the table and had them as being equal stakeholders um, or equal contri contributors to our process. The next phase of this model is to evaluate measures um, evaluation measures are selected and ad adapted in parallel processes of the um, intervention adaptation. So we really wanted to make sure um, that our measures were appropriate. So we translated all of our intervention materials and intervention into Spanish. And we didn't just rely just solely on the translation services, but we went back to the community to make sure that our translations were matching up with what the community um, finds is valuable. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And the last phase of the culture adaptation process model is to integrate the observation and data that we collected from phase two and to roll it into a new adapted intervention. And this is an iterative process and it goes on and on until we really find a good fit. So it's a process of evaluations, revisions, and also reinventions. In this table, I'll um, briefly just share some of the research activities that we did for each phase. So for phase one and setting the stage, and working with um, the community, we hired a translation firm to translate all of our materials. In addition to hiring a translation firm, we hired a Spanish language interviewer um, who looked at and made sure that our, all of our translated material was culturally appropriate. We then took that information and we took it back to the sites who had a large portion of African, excuse me, Hispanic and Latino caregivers to assess and make sure that those needs were adequately addressed in our new updated material. And then we conducted ongoing focus groups just to make sure that all of our content elements, so recruitment material, intervention material were appropriate, and then also we were making sure that we were um, we were picking up on key points to training our interventionists so that they could feel comfortable with properly delivering our intervention. Um, another Another thing that we realized, and I'll talk a little bit more about this next, is that we realized that some of our recruitment material were not appropriate, and so we made some changes to that. In phase two, where we, we were doing some preliminary adaptation testing, we realized that um, the English speaking or Spanish speaking was not going to work. So we broadened our inclusion criteria to include Spanish speaking um, participants. And then we also conducted additional focus groups with the interventionists to see if our adaptive material were um were appropriate. And then currently we were in the, well, we were, our grant site, our grant funding just ended, but we were in the adaptation iteration. So we were testing our adaptation. So we included some of the cultural values, such as the importance of family and respect into our recruitment material. So when we think about the frame and we think about how and why we made these modifications, um, we, we highlighted on certain um, points. So the first aspect of the frame that we looked at was when and how in the implementation process modifications were made. So we realized early in our in early during our implementation of the larger trial, it was evident that we were going to need to enhance and include some cultural and linguistic allocations because we wanted to recruit more Hispanic and Latino caregivers. And we wanted to make sure that the, in, the interventionist staff were effectively delivering our intervention. So our modifications were reactive um, to the, and then we realized that we needed additional support to um, provide uh, adaptations to these sites. So um, because of this, we adapted and we developed a whole other study, a culture adaptation um, study, and we identified ways to um, record our adaptations to tailor our intervention. So, the next step of the phrase is to, to, to document who determined the modifications and what was modified. So we conducted a series of focus groups, three focus groups were the interventionists at the adult day service site. So these um, focus groups identify specific adaptations to the procedures, the protocols, and all of the intervention material. Our focus group findings informed a, a lot of our work. We included things such as being family-centered and respect. One of the things that was really important in our study was that um, 
we thought that flyers and letters was a great way to recruit and to advertise our study, but we learned that that was not the most effective means to recruit folks to our study. So what we did is that we created a video um, an animation that is played at the adult day, adult day service site to um, highlight kind of as a commercial sort of say, um, to highlight our study and to, uh, to increase enrollment of our study as well. So here is just a, a brief table of some of our adaptations made. So of course, we translated all of our material into Spanish. We identified if the Spanish translation was a cultur culturally appropriate. All of our material, we, we reviewed the readability of our material. We realized that our initial material was at a college level. So then we took it down to an eighth or ninth grade reading level. And then we created a recruitment video. I wish I had time to show you the recruitment video, but there's not much time. But the video is very is, is a great video. So please reach out if you're interested in that. Um, in terms of our research material, we identified for all of our survey questions, for example, we identified if there was a Spanish equivalent and we translated um, our assessments if a Spanish equivalent was not available. And then one thing that was really important in terms of our context context level adaptations was that we realized that REDCap was not going to work with our with those sites. And so we re removed the use of technology for data entry. So the sites now scan and they email the data forms because they wanted to participate and very excited to, but REDCap was just not working for them. So we just made some adaptations for them to make it a little bit easier for them to deliver the, the protocol. And so um, the relationship to fidelity and how fidelity was maintained. So Fidelity to our intervention is maintained as long as the major components or ingredients are um, kept into the adaptation. And so the great thing about ADS Plus is that we just changed some of the outside elements of the uh, peripheral aspects of the intervention. We didn't change the core elements to our intervention. And so when I'll talk briefly about this when looking at table three is that when we look at our core principles is that providing customized tailored um, supports culturally sensitive and culturally relevant elements, those are key aspects to the ADS Plus program overall. So by us adapting um, this program for Hispanic and Latino clients, we really didn't change the core principles of the intervention. So our fidelity was maintained. About one minute left, Lauren. Thank you. So um, to conclude, cultural adaptations for caregiver interventions were, are very vital and they may address some of the disparities that we see in caregiver outcomes. And when we're thinking about engaging in cultural adaptations, there are some key and key things to think about. One, funding over and above intervention development is needed. So it took a lot of time and definitely a lot more resources to culturally adapt our intervention. Um, another, some of the budgetary concerns are hiring translation services, having a certified language interviewer, and then also taking the additional time for staff to be trained into the material. And then lastly, it's important to engage cultural experts um, or stakeholders. I'm shying away from using that word stakeholders anymore, um, but it's really important to think about how to use experts and bringing them to the table to ensure that um, their knowledge is being recognized in an equal way. So thank you for the time. And I would like to acknowledge the other co-authors on this paper. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Lauren. And I see that there, you know, have been um, a couple of maybe one or two comments um, interest in that video. So maybe if you could also include your contact information in the chat too, I think that would be great. Okay, and then um, Jamie Hughes is our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Thank you, Julie. And I am pleased to uh, wrap us up in terms of the presentations. I was really thrilled to be a part of some of the initial conversations, thinking about putting together this special issue and um, just absolutely delighted to see it formally released and really grateful to be a part of this conversation today to share our particular work. So the piece that I will be uh, discussing today is intensification of implementation strategies developing a model of foundational and enhanced implementation approaches to support national adoption and scale up. So I have really just a portion of my affiliations here on the screen. I'm a faculty member at Wake Forest University School of Medicine, both in the Division of Geriatric Medicine, but also in the nation's first and only academic affiliated Department of Implementation Science. 
So if implementation science interests you, we are constantly growing and expanding. I'm always happy to hear from folks who are interested in joining us. But the other hat that I wear is really working with the VA healthcare system. And that's really at the heart of the work that I'll be discussing today. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the many talents and efforts and energies that went into this work. The folks that are listed on the left-hand column are our formal co-authors listed on this manuscript. But this project is really not possible without many, many talents, um, including those that you see on the screen, also in the right-hand column. And I also want to be sure to note that this work is actually dedicated to our near and dear colleague um, and kind of the brains and glue that held this project together, uh, Liz Mahana. So if you're not familiar with the QUERY program or the Quality Enhancement Research Initiative within the VA healthcare system, this is really actually where a lot of implementation really started in the VA and it was born out of not just the query, but the VA system as a whole. So I encourage you to look for resources. There are a number of cyber seminars, trainings, and the query program supports a variety of programs throughout the national VA healthcare system here in the United States, both on implementation process, um, implementation initiatives, for widespread kind of models of care, as well as population and condition specific uh, initiatives. So our particular program is Function Query, which is optimizing function and independence in older veterans. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of our program, this is similar to uh, if you're familiar with NIH uh, funded centers, a PO1, this is a large kind of center grant really composed of three individual evidence-based programs or EBPs. So very briefly, those programs include STRIDE, which is a hospital-based walking program. Caregivers First, which as you might guess by the name, provides skills training and support for caregivers of our veterans. A group physical therapy, which really focuses on increasing or improving access to PT for veterans specifically with knee OA. So in the rest of the table, you see the settings in which these programs take place. So we have a range from the hospital to outpatient settings, and we have a number of different disciplines involved in actually planning and delivering these interventions. So we're actually in our second phase of function query. Our first phase or our initial implementation phase took place from 2016 to 2021. And I'll note that there were a number of local trials, quality improvement initiatives, pilot funding and the like before 2016. This program focused on national rollout. So I'm really kind of focusing on how do we go big once we have programs that work. But we had a small number of sites. So eight sites for each are stride and caregivers first. So these were individual VA medical centers located across the United States. And then our group physical therapy or group PT program was in a little bit different place. And it was focused just on a quality improvement initiative at a single VA medical center. So I failed to, to recognize that the function query program is based at the Durham VA medical center here in North Carolina. Um, Duke University is often our academic affiliate. In expanding to our current implementation phase, so we had a high number, uh, a lot of success in our initial phase and really thought, okay, what's the next step? What are the implementation strategies or approaches or supports that are needed to go from eight sites, not even doubling or tripling, um, but rapidly increasing the number of sites that we scaled these programs to? So how do we get from a small number of sites to a larger number of sites? So although our funding formally started in 2021, we actually started planning really right as the pandemic hit. So we were gathering on Zoom, just like we're doing today, trying to put our minds together. We sort of focused our, our second phase of grant funding around this idea of strategies for national scale up. But as you know, you write a grant and there's a big difference. And then once you actually get a grant, you have to really figure out how you're going to put that work into place. So that's where we were. And our focus today is really to kind of take a little bit of a different approach and really open up kind of the black box, not just of what happens within implementation science, but really the black box of how do we do and develop the science and how do we actually advance the science of implementation science. So throughout our work, um, we've really been guided by two particular frameworks. 
The first is the replicating effective frame, excuse me, replicating effective programs or REP. And the second is the dynamic sustainability framework. So REP can really be operationalized in two different ways. One as a framework consisting of kind of these distinct phases, or it's also often operationalized as a bundle of implementation strategies. And in our function query work, we really rely on kind of both of those um, operational as, uh, operational, we operationalize it in both ways. So the key to think about REP is really implementation occurs in a series of distinct phases. Implementation is a process here. It's sh shown as kind of a unidirectional um, process, a clear, neat phase. We know really it's iterative, it's cyclical. Um, in these phases, you can move ahead and you can take steps back. Um, but really the idea is there are distinct phases, planning or pre-implementation, the active delivery or implementing the program, and then maintaining or sustaining that program over time. Another key uh, framework for our work, especially we're in a national system where the, the, the saying really is, if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. And we know that in taking programs from, let's say, our original site at the Durham VA Medical Center to a site maybe in the Midwest or maybe on the West Coast, that there are variations in different settings that our program may need to adapt to best meet the kind of needs and capacities and resources of those different settings. We also know that they're kind of inherent or natural shifts in a program over time. Some of those things are good. We wanna align our program to fit the needs and uh, capacity of the local setting, but we also wanna make sure we maintain fidelity. So how can we really think of these things, implementation as a process and balancing kind of adaptation and fidelity as we think about scaling broadly. So our work in this special issue, again, really kind of tries to shed light on our process of how we built and how we thought about a scalable implementation approach. So I won't talk about these steps in details. I invite you to take a look at our uh, uh, paper in the special issue. But briefly, what we did is we really took time to think and reflect on what had we learned from our initial five years and the studies prior to those five years. We took data from our frontline uh, VA medical centers that were adopting our EBPs. We conducted listening sessions with some of our operational partners from our implementation specialists who had gone to site visits as, at these different um, implementing sites or implementing teams. We also know that the literature is constantly changing and expanding including the sustainment literature. So we took some time to review the literature for any new or emerging evidence on implementation strategies for both scalability and sustainability. And then we took all of that information to think about, okay, what are the core components of implementation support? How do we deliver that to 16, 24, and 32 sites, which were the number of sites that we were working with? And what does that mean in terms of, do we need to make adaptations for our different EBPs? As you saw, there are different settings, there are different delivery teams. And then finally, how will we evaluate whether these implementation support components work or not? So just quickly thinking and very, very briefly summarizing, what did we learn from our initial five plus years of research? Again, I've mentioned if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. So we saw a lot of variation in terms of how much implementation support sites needed. So I failed to uh, mention in our first five years, we had teams of individuals going out to these sites, doing in-person multi-day site visits. Again, this was 2020. The option to do in-person visits, not only was that not scalable, it just really wasn't an option given the, the state of the pandemic at the time. We also looked back at our logs. Sites took 100 or plus more hours of implementation support that wasn't scalable when we were going to as many as 32 sites. All of our support is provided by our central team in Durham. We're small, we're mighty, um, but there are only so many hours in the day. So thinking about what's feasible. At the same time that we saw these challenges, we also looked at these kind of uh, observations as strengths as facilitators. Some sites, they just needed a toolkit and a few webinars and a conversation or two and they were off and running. They could implement a new EBP um, without much support at all. 
We also start to, started to realize that maybe some of these sites that had a lot of QI or implementation experience or had a culture of innovation at their medical facility were really a little bit more ready. So maybe some of it was capacity, maybe some of it was culture. And really what we, the kind of greatest finding and experience from our first initial implementation phase was something that sites asked for. They wanted to learn from one another. They asked us to develop mechanisms to bring them together in what we call a sort of a learning collaborative so they could discuss tips and strategies with one another. So this on the screen, if you're familiar with implementation strategies, so if you're not, this is the kind of the things, the stuff that we do to try and get programs and settings and new, um, new partners to adopt our evidence-based uh, programs or practices. So these are implementation strategi strategies categorized in these kind of different buckets. Um, so using evaluation and iterating, training and education, we've heard about adaptation, developing stakeholder relationships, providing interactive assistance. We really wanted to think about what strategies could one be scalable and what would be appropriate for, again, a large number of sites. So remember that REP framework, we know that implementation is a process that occurs over these kind of distinct phases. So based on our prior work, what we had done both uh, in our face-to-face -face, uh, site visits and over telephone and web-based support, we thought about, again, what are those larger categories of implementation strategies that might be most effective at these different phases of intervention? So how can we focus in the pre-implementation or planning phases on building and educating our teams, gaining support from hospital or medical center leadership, monitoring the progress, adapting our EBPs to the local site. We also know, again, despite the fact that this graphic shows, oh, implementation is a nice, clear, you're always moving forward. No, we all hit bumps in the road. So when is there opportunity and need to engage in problem solving and iterative improvement? So then what would that look like for our particular function query and our three EBPs? So we really kind of operationalize that into a set of tools across these three phases. And I won't talk about any of these uh, tools in detail. I invite you to ask questions in the chat or, off to, or also reach out to me afterwards. Um, but the thought is you see these kind of toolkit, web resources. Um, the idea is how can we, again, provide, um, based on this idea that some sites don't need a lot of support, can we provide kind of self-guided asynchronous tools? And so that's exactly what we did. We decided what of these tools can we provide through a SharePoint, through a toolkit, through webinars? What can we offer to sites to help them get started on their own? But again, we know that they wanna talk to each other. There's value in, in connecting with other sites going through these same um, kind of challenges or processes. So we bring sites together on a monthly basis, and then we bring national sites together on a quarterly basis and structured learning collaboratives. But oh, again, oh, okay, sorry, thanks, Julie. <laughs> but remember, we can't, not every site has the capacity or the resources. Some sites just might need a little bit of help. They're all going through a pandemic. So for a select number of sites, we provide a more intensive one-on-one -on -one assistance through external facilitation. I won't go through our evaluation plan, but I invite you to kind of draw your eye to the right-hand side of the screen. And the idea here is, did some sites meet adoption goals, yes or no? This is how we're really trying to evaluate our overarching question and just how much support are sites able to implement on their own with some minimal self-guided support? If not, is more extensive support? Is it feasible? Is it effective? And we are nearing the end of our data collection and look forward to uh, sharing results in the coming year or so. So as I close, kind of big takeaways, one size fits all might not be scalable. So how can we reserve intensive support for sites that don't adopt? And we did this in collaboration with our stakeholders and users, operational offices, with the hope that that improves our process. So in close, I invite questions during the Q&A and also welcome you uh, to reach out to me either at my academic or yes, I am Jane. I'm under my legal name at the VA. 
Um, so don't ask, the names don't make any sense, but I welcome questions um, at either place. So I will close and thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. All right, so that we have come to the Q&A part and we welcome questions. I know that I've seen a little bit of chat activity, mostly related to that video. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute and ask. Um, any of the speakers, or um, feel free to write something in the chat as well. Otherwise, I'm going to ask all the questions. <laughs> I think I'm going to go ahead and start then. Um, Jamie, you and I have been talking a long time, but today's presentation really helped me to appreciate why uh, so much of the implementation science research comes out of the VA system. And there have been times where I really thought like, well, what, what can somebody like me learn about the VA? I mean, how many systems are like that with all these similar sites across the country? But you explain, nope, this is like trying to bring your intervention to lots of really different places. And so that was helpful. I appreciated some of the terms that you introduced me to as well. You referenced at the end of that presentation, not all sites needed the same support. And so you had different types of support, I guess, modalities and different amounts that they could access. Was there some way that you helped a site determine or that you determined what a site had to do could do, encouraged more accessing of supports at some sites? Great question. Um, so it is all randomly decided. So we actually randomize our sites um, to the amount of support they get, either starting with that self-guided kind of um, low touch support so our sites are actually randomized before um, we evaluate everyone on sort of a six month adoption benchmark. So there could have been a number of different ways. We could have said, hey, what do you, what do you think you need and want? What intensity of support and respond to sites needs or preferences? Or a different study design would be saying, okay, everyone who doesn't adopt um, gets intensive support. But one thing we're really interested in and the, the reason we chose our kind of model that we did is sometimes sites just need more time. It's not a matter of um, it's not a matter of simply getting more intensive support. Sometimes they just, and we saw that the pandemic was certainly a great example of some sites would, you know, have a have a COVID wave or having staffing shortages mm -hmm. and simply just needed more time. So to answer your question, it is randomly um assigned so unfortunately some sites that don't adopt don't get um don't get intensive uh support thanks for that lauren i don't know if you saw in the chat i can yeah. read for you this question that you had from donna uh, about uh, asking you for some more detail on cultural aspects implemented with that ads plus project thanks donna yeah, and Shannon, just to Lauren to to add on to that right before that, as Gregory Smith asked, what is the best space for cultural adaptation? So maybe you can include that in your response. Thanks for those questions. So um, to answer the first question, the first the best phase for cultural adaptation is anytime you deem it's appropriate. So that's the really good thing about cultural adaptations. It's kind of like when you mark, when you notice that there's an, uh, an issue or a concern or a justification for the modifications to address for a culture, you can um, do that at any time. And that's the wonderful thing about interventions. Um, and then in terms of some of the culture aspects that were included, some of our um, aspects that were included were thinking about um, family and also respect. That was a huge thing that we learned from our focus groups that family is really important. Um, when we think about initially when we were thinking about ADS plus, it was really based on like a primary care 
caregiver, but we know oftentimes some cultural groups have more than just one person providing care. So think about that one person, per, one person providing care. It's not always a scenario for every situation. So we really wanted to make sure that we included the aspect of family and why family is important. And so if I were to show you the video, for example, in a video, we have a daughter driving her um, father or male figure to the adult day program and showing that relationship and how it's important um, in taking and providing care. So that was one um, huge aspect that we included in our implement in our work for implementation. Donna, did that help with your question also? Yes, it did. Thank you. All right. I had a question for Natasha about the current state of that technology. We know we got your manuscript months and months ago. What's the latest? So right now it's being tested um, in Dr. Thomas hodges Rothless's lab. Um, and uh, it's being tested and we're looking at accuracy and it looks pretty accurate in terms of detecting that pain. So that's really exciting. And the next step is to pilot it in a few long-term care homes. Um, and talking about implantation science, we're going to be doing some of those similar measures before, during and after to be able to see if we can predict actual use of that technology. So really exciting stuff. Um, and it's, yeah, taken a lot of time to develop that technology. A lot of time. You and Jamie and Lauren both uh, demonstrated that. And it's pretty cool that uh, implementation science can be with you at each of the steps, sometimes with the same, sometimes with different models. Julie, how about you? Did you have any questions come up after this? No, I think, um, gosh, they were all great presentations and I love and just really good examples of this issue, right? How um, how we were able to show so much good work that's going on in this space. So um, I'm just thrilled that we were able to showcase a few of the speakers and the special issue. You know, something that um, I agree is something that uh, still strikes me. And we have one paper in that special issue that addresses it. As somebody who didn't um, start out their graduate training and research career familiar with implementation science theories and frameworks, it can be really overwhelming the number of them that are out there. And um, I see that come up in the literature pretty frequently as a, a, a potential strength, a potential weakness, a source of criticism. And I don't know if our, our speakers or Julie, if you'd like to, to speak to that. Again, we do have a review paper in the special issue that uh, lists a number of them out and talks about which ones tend to come up most frequently. Uh, several of those were presented today. Any, any thoughts on... Uh, the helpfulness or the confusion that it can create to have so many models available. I'm happy to say a few words. I think that was, I was uh, also uh, involved in that kind of overview of theories, models and frameworks. I think it's, you know, one, there are, there are an overwhelming number of theories, models and frameworks. Um, both for implementation science and kind of our related fields, you know, maybe behavioral science and within the social sciences. There are a number of great resources um, to help kind of guide and educate folks who are new to the field in implementation science. One that comes to mind is the University of Washington has a great number of resources. You know, I think we tend to think about um, you know, implementation science, determinants, processes, outcomes, you know, there are ways to kind of have bite-sized pieces to kind of chew, chew and digest. And I think the other thing I would just say is, you know, I know I'm seeing some interest in the chat of having a, an implementation science and gerontology 2.0. Um, I, along with some colleagues, um, have been very interested in expanding uh, kind of training and opportunities uh, for implementation science specific to aging settings and programs and populations. So I think if that's something that's of interest, you know, please share. You can reach out to me directly. Um, I don't want to volunteer GSA staff. They're off camera, so they can't make faces at me, but 
I think it would be a great, um, we know that our aging population is quite different and diverse. Karen says yes. Um, you know, so thinking about how, how can we advance the training and the resources for all of those who work with this population in, in this space, um, I think would be a great initiative um, and opportunity. I think that I'm not imagining that there has been some recent conversation about an interest group in GSA. I know there's an interest group in another implementate the implementation science focused organization, but that would be something to consider and uh, it can open up all kinds of opportunities that GSA would be really uh, lucky and happy to support. And so I think with us being right at the hour, I want to thank our presenters for um, keeping themselves to time and sharing the highlights of their work, as well as introducing those different implementation science theories and frameworks that uh, help them to this point. And obviously, we can see their work is going to continue. I appreciate Karen and Judy for getting us started, my colleague uh, Julie for uh, working through this with me and all of our attendees. Really glad to see you today. And again, this information will be available. We're gonna um, find a way if we didn't already share that video that Lauren has got. And uh, this will be available on the GSA YouTube website as well. Anything else, Julie? Oh, no, I just see that uh, Karen put the link to the special issue in the chat as well. So if you haven't seen it or don't have the link to it, um, it is in there for as a resource for you. Check out the 15 other great papers that you didn't get to hear about today and definitely those from our presenters. Thanks so much. I'm really grateful for your time and your expertise and your interest. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Care, Thank everyone. you, everyone. Bye.